welcome friends, it's Miss Gisa. Today we're going to read about a poet laureate. Before we start our story, I'd like to practice some rhyming. Many poets use rhyming and cadence in their poetry. Let's use my name, Gisa. What words can you think of that rhyme with Gisa? That's right, Lisa. What else? Hmm. Visa, Visa, Lisa, Gisa. All right, let's get started with our story for today. Our story is called Exquisite, The Poetry and Life of Gwendolyn Brooks, written by Suzanne Slade and illustrated by Cosby A. Cabrera. Gwendolyn grew up in the big city of Chicago with little money to spare, yet her family owned great treasure a bookcase filled with precious poems. Each night her father read fine poetry aloud, passionate and proud. Nothing sounded sweeter to Gwendolyn than father's deep voice reciting the rhythmic words. Gwendolyn memorized those lines, fine words in time to share with her big hugging aunts. When she was seven, Gwendolyn began arranging words into poems of her own. One day, her mother found those scribbly lines and announced with sincere conviction, as mothers do when making a prediction, you are going to be the Lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Gwendolyn beamed. He was her favorite poet. Gwendolyn loved to sit on her big back porch with colorful clouds dancing overhead and dream about her future. I was at my happiest sitting out on the back porch to sit there and look out at the western sky with all those beautiful changing clouds and just to dream about the future, which was going to be ecstatically exquisite like those clouds. Writing became like eating and breathing to Gwendolyn. It was something she just had to do. She carefully strung words together like elegant jewels in perfect meter and time. Her rhythmic lines described paper dolls and tick-tock blocks, raindrops, sunsets, and climbing rocks. She poured her poems into notebooks, filled them to the very tops. Her room became a swelling sea of poems. When Gwendolyn turned 11, she decided to set her words free and mailed four prized poems to a newspaper. Her words were printed on crisp, pages for the whole neighborhood to see. Elated, she sent her nature poem, Eventide, to a magazine. It appeared on shiny pages for the entire country to read. Gwendolyn's future seemed as bright as morning's first clouds, but then a storm blew in, the Great Depression. With too few jobs for too many workers, her father's pay was cut in half. Dinner each night was the same, beans. Hungry for food, yet more hungry for words, Gwendolyn kept writing. She sent more poems to magazines, but they were all rejected. In high school, Gwendolyn felt rejected too. She was too quiet and shy for some crowds, her skin too dark for others. Every year she tried a different school, all white, all black, and a mix of both, but she didn't seem to fit in anywhere. Gwendolyn felt invisible, but when her words flowed from her pen, she became invincible. So she spent more time than ever writing, exploring new ways to express her ideas. She even wrote a history report in rhyme. Her paper earned an A and a note from the teacher that said to keep writing. Soon Gwendolyn headed off to college where she devoured thick books of poetry, Dickinson, Wordsworth, and Hughes and penned poems about her family and friends. After graduation, jobs were still hard to come by and poems didn't pay the bills. So Gwendolyn found work wherever she could, cleaning homes, typing, even making deliveries. Then along came Henry, a handsome man who adored poetry too. The two married and squeezed into a tiny apartment in a black neighborhood where they were supposed to live. A year later, baby Henry arrived. A busy wife and mother, Gwendolyn continued to write. She took a poetry class at night where she studied modern poems with different length lines. 
unpredictable meter and time. Inspired, she created unique poems about the nonstop busyness, the hard luck grittiness of life in her South Side Chicago neighborhood, Bronzeville, where businesses boomed on 47th Street, where hardworking families didn't have enough to eat, where people jumped and jived to a new jazzy beat. And Gwendolyn kept polishing her words until they sparkled like silvery summer clouds. I am proud to feature people and their concerns, their troubles as well as their joys. Eventually, one of her poems won a contest, then another and another. Some were published in a famous poetry journal, but they still couldn't pay the bills. Even without electricity, Gwendolyn kept writing by candlelight, stories about life on her busy Bronzeville streets. I wrote about what I saw and heard in the street. And she kept dreaming about a future that was going to be exquisite. Then one day beneath a promising patch of clouds, she gathered her finest poems, stories of hardship and hope, slid them into an envelope and mailed them to a book publisher in New York City. Then she waited and worried and wondered, would they like the stories about people in her neighborhood? Soon a letter arrived. The publisher wanted more, twice as many as before. So Gwendolyn composed poems in different forms, free verse, ballads, sonnets. She wrote about brave soldiers like her brother fighting for a country that didn't give everyone equal rights. She wrote about a poor man named Satin Leg Smith who fancied fine clothes. She wrote about understanding her identity, who you are on the inside. Her tired fingers wrote day and night until finally she had enough to send to the publisher. Before long, another letter came. Gwendolyn grabbed that envelope, ran into the bedroom and locked the door. Hands trembling, she opened it. The publisher loved her poems. Soon they became a beautiful book, a street in Bronzeville. But Gwendolyn had more stories to share, important stories about a young girl growing up, getting married and starting her own family in a city where people judged others by the color of their skin. Those powerful poems became her second book, Annie Allen. Gwendolyn's words drifted into the world like bright, brilliant clouds. Her poems helped people better understand others. They encouraged people to take a closer look at themselves. They changed the way some people thought and acted. But even two books couldn't pay all the bills. Money was tighter than ever. Yet everywhere she looked, Gwendolyn saw more stories that needed to be told. So she kept writing. Then one cloudy day in May, Gwendolyn's electricity was turned off again. Suddenly the phone in her dark apartment started ringing. Was it another bill collector? She hesitated and then picked up the phone. A reporter on the other end asked one question. Do you know that you have won the Pulitzer Prize? Gwendolyn couldn't believe it. She grabbed her son and danced around the apartment. Outside, exquisite clouds exploded in the sunset sky because Gwendolyn had won the greatest prize in poetry. Here's a poem written by Gwendolyn Brooks called Clouds. And she wrote this when she was 15 years old. Oh, when I look into the sky and see those quiet clouds, now all arrayed in fleecy white, now dressed in colored shrouds, it seems I cannot draw my eye from that rich heaven land and drinking in the wide expanse, I filled with rapture stand. Unheedful of my transfixed state, they float serenely by, those stately clouds calm centuries of the sky. How can I fear to leave the earth when heaven holds this glow? Cloud-colored happiness and peace await me there, I know. In 1950, Gwendolyn Brooks became the first black person to win a Pulitzer Prize her poetry for her second book, Annie Allen. Over the next five decades, she wrote 14 more books, including a poetry book for children titled Bronzeville Boys and Girls. Gwendolyn often wrote about real life topics that were important to her, such as love, loneliness, family, inequality, poverty, and war. 
In her later years, Gwendolyn sh shared her passion for poetry by teaching writing classes at various colleges around Chicago. She also personally sponsored writing contests to help inspire young poets. In 1968, Gwendolyn was named Poet Laureate of Illinois. She was appointed the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress in 1985. The first black woman to hold that prestigious position. Note in her autobiography, Brooks stated she preferred the term black instead of African American. Her preference is reflected in this book. I remember I was in elementary school in 1985 when Gwendolyn Brooks was appointed the Poet Laureate Consultant of Poetry. I'm from Chicago and we learned about Gwendolyn Brooks in school. Thank you for joining us for our read aloud today. Please join us again and remember to like and subscribe to support our channel.